Occasionally, I get stressed. Uh, I think we all do. If you don't get stressed, you're some kind of superhuman. And usually the stress is okay, right? A tough test, an important argument with someone you care about. Um, but sometimes this amount of stress can go from the medium kind of okay amount to, hmm, this is too much stress. Hmm, I can't handle it. And at this point, at this point where stress becomes too much, it actually starts to hinder our performance. There is an inverted U-shaped relationship between stress and cognitive performance. So once we hit our peak, our stress level peak, we're performing at our peak cognitive performance. But once we get a little bit more stress, a little bit too stressed, our cognitive performance starts to drop. Our brain starts to fizzle and we stop performing as well. So stress is something that's gonna pop up a lot, right? It happens to everyone and everyone is gonna have to deal with it probably at some point in their life. So I wanted to make a video and what this video is going to be about are three evidence-based tips for combating the stress that you can start doing today. This is not just what I think is best, right? This is also what I found to be most heavily supported in the academic journals that I've been searching through. If you don't know me, uh, my name is Zach and I'm an MS2. I guess I'm in MS3 now, right? Because I just took my big test. I'm in MS3 here in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. As a disclaimer, I am not a medical professional. This is not medical advice. These are just things that I have found personally helpful for combating stress. And these are also things that I've found referenced in journals that are interesting to read about and talk about. Keep in mind, I am definitely biased here, right? When I was first doing the research for this paper, I looked at maybe three or four papers very quickly. And then I decided on three major pillars that I wanted to talk about. And then after that, when I was looking for scientific articles, articles and papers, I was looking for articles and papers that supported my already initial ideas. So even though the journals I am referencing are some of the most impactful and powerful journals there are, I am biased in the journals and articles that I am picking. Also, even with these highly reputed articles and scientific journals, you should realize that they're not always perfect, right? You should look at these articles yourself, come at them with a hint of skepticism, come at this video with a hint of skepticism and make your own decision based on what you've seen. This is just a video to give you more information and kind of insight into something that I found personally helpful. Check out my sources, I'll list them all below. Maybe you'll disagree with me, maybe you'll disagree with the researchers, who knows? Also, I do not mention eating or sleeping properly, right? Because those are really, really important things as well, but that would make this video way too long. So let's get into it. First, we're gonna talk about what is stress. Let's start with defining stress, and this is one of the many definitions of stress I found in these academic journals, and it is very confusing, and it confused me, so just let this text kind of wash over your head, because I know it did me. Stress is defined as a state of threatened or perceived by the individual as threatened homeostasis, and it is re-established by a complex repertoire of behavioral and physiological adaptive responses of the organism. Okay. What does all that mumbo jumbo mean? Well, more simply, it's just our body's response to a perceived threat. And this stress kind of thing seems to be affecting a lot of people. The World Health Organization says stress is the second most common health problem of people of the European Union, impacting one third of people employed by the European Union. And stress has been associated with many things, briefly cardiovascular disease, uh, obesity, and depression. More interesting to me though, when I was again doing my background research for this video, I saw that there seems to be an association between certain times of stress and actual physical changes in the human brain, not mice, not rat brain, the human brain when we are exposed to stress for certain times. And these changes were specifically found in the hippocampus and the amygdala. That's crazy, right? This stress thing can actually change our brain. How can we fight this? How can we fight the stress and how can we improve ourselves and our performance and our just general well-being? Well, let's start with mindset. A positive mindset is vital, and I want to eliminate some misconceptions about mindset right off the bat. A positive mindset isn't necessarily ignoring all the bad things and only focusing on the good things, although that is part of it. It's more of saying, okay, these bad things, maybe they're not so bad. So let's say, for example, we're doing leg day at the gym, which everyone loves, and you start, it's hurting, right? It sucks. It really sucks. Every body weight squats, right? Everyone can do body weight squats. You squat down and you come, nope, nope. <sighs> Oh, it's a Thursday. Can't do no legs on Thursday. Friday, I'll do the Friday legs. I'll go and I'll think my legs are tired of shit. Why am I doing this? I always wear pants. No one can see my legs. Well, it, do it, it doesn't matter. What about I think about it another way? Hmm, if this hurts, Maybe it's a sign that I'm improving. Maybe it's a sign that I'm getting better. And remember when I talked about those changes in the brain? Well, for this section is where I saw those changes. Positive thinking, a positive mindset has been associated with changes in the amygdala, which is pretty cool. And for the sake of length of this video, I'm gonna split this kind of positive thinking into three separate sections. And those sections are eliminating negative thinking, focusing more on positive thinking, and self-esteem. 
One of the most important things you can do when a negative thought comes up is identify. The other day I was stuck in traffic as many people are and I remember thinking I'm wasting a ton of time here, this really sucks, and who the hell would buy one of those cube shaped cars? Normally this kind of thought would permeate my brain without me even noticing it and it kind of is the status quo, right? These negative thoughts, this kind of ugh, ugh, is the status quo. However, remembering I was working on this video, I thought, wait a second, what if I just identified this thought? What if I just thought, hmm, Zach, you're thinking negatively. You're thinking that this is bad to be stuck in traffic. And I identified it. I didn't do anything else. I just identified it and it helped me. Some other kind of forms of negative thought to look out for are filtering. Filtering is magnifying and only focusing on the negative things of what's going on, not the positive ones. So for example, I play tennis and sometimes I'll have a great forehand, I'll have a great backhand, but my serve will be sucking that day, which happens a lot. And I'll just think about my serve sucks, my serve sucks, my serve sucks, and I'll just forget about my forehand and my backhand, which are pretty good. The other thing is personalizing, and this means you're blaming yourself for everything. Well, what could this look like? Well, say I was meeting a friend for coffee and about an hour before they canceled. Well, if I was going falling into this negative thought train, personalizing, then I might think, hmm, this person isn't showing up because they hate me, they don't wanna be my friend anymore, and they think the way I dress is stupid. The third is a worst case scenario situation. So for example, if you spill your coffee in the morning, I know we're kind of coffee themed right now, but say you spill your coffee in the morning, then you immediately think, okay, this is a sign. The rest of the day is going to suck. The rest of the day is going to be awful. So let's develop an action plan for these negative thoughts. I've developed something that's kind of helped me for these negative thoughts. So step one is identify it. What is the thought popping into my head? Is it a negative thought? Is it really that bad a thing? Can I just notice the thought and just notice it? That's it. Not attach a feeling to it, not say it's good or bad, just notice it. And the second thing, which we're gonna talk a lot more about next, but is spin it positive. For example, can me thinking, this is really hard, this suck, transform into, this is hard, this sucks, which means it's gonna be good for me because it's gonna make me stronger and better as a person. And I just finished rereading Viktor Frankl's A Man's Search for Meaning, and one of my favorite quotes of the entire book is, which is kind of the general theme of the entire book, is, everything can be taken from a man but one thing, the last of his human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. So take action. What are you constantly thinking about in a negative way? A tough commute, going to the gym. Can you identify that thought as a first step and then transform it into a positive thought? It will do worlds and worlds of benefits for you, I promise, because it's helped me a lot. Bottom line, negative thinking tends to be the status quo. Identify it and turn it into a positive one. Next, let's talk about positive thinking. Positive thinking is where we want to be. Hopefully we're turning some of our negative thoughts into positive thoughts. And maybe we can just grasp onto that positive thought a little bit longer, notice it a little bit longer. And if we wanna get really crazy, if we wanna get really wild, maybe we start identifying new positive things in our life. An important thing I realized when I was thinking about this video is that when you're finding these new positive things, it's exactly that, you're finding them. So what does finding mean, right? It means it was always there. It was just in some different place and you didn't know where it was. So the positive things were always there, right? We're just finding them for ourselves. We're identifying them newly for ourselves. We're only finding these positive things, right? Because they are lost to us. In reality, these positive things are always there. One way we can start kind of identifying new positive things is take a look at your surroundings. Maybe you're outside and the breeze is really nice and the temperature is kind of in that perfect in-between where it's not too hot and it's not too cold. It feels kind of just right. Or maybe you're in your office and you've never noticed that cool piece of artwork over there. Or hey, the chair you get to sit on, it's a pretty comfy chair, right? Maybe in the morning you realize, wow, this hot shower is really nice. I wonder how many people get to experience such a nice kind of feeling of cleanliness and calmness and kind of warmth in the morning. And this is a form of meditation, but we will get to that later. The next thing is try to be more open to humor, smile more often, especially in difficult times. And one of my biggest challenges is to look for humor in this video because there is so little of it. If you can find the humor in this video, if you can tr smile during one of my videos, you're really an expert at this topic. And if you wanna take it to an advanced level, who knows, maybe you even make someone else laugh, maybe you make someone else smile. And next and final mini tip for getting more positive thinking is your life. Surround yourself with positive people. I'm sure you've heard this before, but you are the average of the five people you surround yourself with the most. Now, I think this is an accurate statement and an important statement. This doesn't necessarily mean eliminating negative people from your life, although this is usually the best option. Maybe it means having a conversation with someone in your life who's a little bit more negative than you like. Now, this is, obviously a really hard thing to do, but could benefit you immensely in the long run. Bottom line, notice the positive things around you. There are tons of them.
And finally, our final sub bullet of the bullet of mindset is self-esteem. Now this is a hugely important one. When I was doing my research for this video, it seemed kind of to be one of the, if not the most important aspect of reducing stress and improving performance. Epidemiological studies, and just briefly, epidemiological studies is just a fancy word for looking at specific health effects in relation to specific populations. So these studies show an association between global health and life expectancy. Also low self-esteem and depression are strongly related. So why is it bad to have bad self-esteem? How can this affect your day-to-day? -day? Well, maybe if you have low self-esteem and a certain challenging situation comes up, you hide from that situation. You avoid challenges. Now this reaction is something that's done by everyone. I've done this before, but this is actually a losing strategy because it becomes the rule and not an exception. You start to avoid challenges and kind of fade away from hard things in life, which we're all gonna experience. Constantly avoiding these challenges in your life will only reinforce the fear and anxiety surrounding these challenges and make it harder and harder and harder to break out of this kind of negative self-esteem spiral. Don't worry, it's not all doom and gloom. There are ways we can get out of this negative self-esteem spiral and improve ourselves and improve our image of ourselves. Similar to negative thoughts, the first step is identifying this negative self-esteem, this negative thinking. So for my action challenge for self-esteem, I want you to take out a piece of paper and write down everything negative about yourself. I write down every negative thought you have about yourself. Try not to get too mean or too crazy, but notice the kind of the things that pop into your head. You think I'm too ugly to meet someone special or I'm too stupid to take on a new challenge. And maybe take five minutes, nothing crazy, to just fill up kind of one side of a piece of paper with these kind of negative thoughts. And you're only writing on the one half of the piece of paper because we're gonna use the other half for something. This is a very strong step in itself. You're identifying these negative thoughts. You're saying, hey, I'm gonna see what's going on here. I'm gonna do a nice checkup and see what's going on. Next, and this is gonna take a while, but it's important. You should work through all of these negative thoughts and prove them wrong with evidence. So for the two examples I gave, maybe you remember how, oh, someone actually commented on how nice I look the other day, or I feel very like good looking in this certain piece of clothing or in this certain dress I could wear. And for the feeling that you're too stupid, you think maybe actually, you know what? I'm kind of really good at this certain thing. And people seem to come to me for advice around this certain topic. And actually I did pretty good on that project. You can see this could go on and on and on, but it's a good way to kind of reframe these negative self-esteem thoughts. Those are a great two steps for kind of identifying and changing these negative thoughts. Now I'm gonna just talk about some random other tips that I find helpful. At the end of every day, I write down two things that went well that day. That's it, just two things. This can be as simple as I went to the gym or as deep as I helped my family member through a tough time. Another tip is fake it till you make it. It's cliche, but it usually works. Another way to improve your self-esteem is to give yourself a challenge and work towards it. Exercise is a really good challenge to work towards. The last thing is start saying no. Your time is valuable. You are valuable. Be specific and purposeful with this time that you have. You are not required to set yourself on fire to keep other people warm. Bottom line is believe in yourself. You're pretty cool. So we made it through the first bullet, the first big chunk of wonka. Chunk of wonka is now an official word that will be referenced in Webster's Dictionary. Let's talk about the second major bullet point. The second major bullet point is exercise. In one study, college students participating in certain activities were questioned on mood and anxiety before and after class. Specifically, they looked at swimmers and yoga participants. Now, swimmers had an unusually positive before swim mood and reported less tension and confusion after swim. People that did yoga were significantly less anxious, tense, depressed, angry, fatigued, and confused after their yoga class than before. And this is just the tip of the iceberg. In a randomized controlled trial, 134 patients with heart disease were given routine medical care, which is the control, or they were told to exercise, or they were told to participate in a stress reduction class. We're just gonna focus on the control versus exercise. So how did they measure this? Well, they looked at general distress, depression, and physical character characteristics of the heart. And one result that stood out to me was the left ventricular ejection fraction. And the only, all that is, is just the amount of blood that goes into your left ventricle that is squeezed out. And the left ventricle is the ventricle in your heart that ejects the more oxygenated blood to the rest of your body. The right ventricle is the part of the heart that ejects the deoxygenated blood to the lungs. So the lungs can pick up the oxygen and then come back to go all the way through the atria, blah, 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 to the left ventricle so they can eject it out. So what percentage of this oxygenated blood that is reaching our body is important, right? So what did they see in this left ventricular ejection fraction in people who exercise as compared to controls? Well, it showed significant improvement. That means that the percentage of 
oxygenated blood, the percentages of that good blood that our heart is squeezing out is higher when we exercise. One hour of 45 minutes of exercise a week total for four months was associated with a significantly increased left ventricular ejection fraction, a significantly increased percentage of blood that is oxygenated reaching your body. They also saw that depression and anxiety were significantly reduced with exercise. But let me use their words instead of my words, and they said, exercise reduced emotional distress and improved markers of cardiovascular risk more than usual medical care alone. Some other good things that exercise does is it releases endorphins, which are just good feeling neurotransmitters, digestive and immune benefits, and is associated with mood improvement. I think, hopefully, I've convinced you that exercise is good. How do we start doing it? So the American Heart Association, or the AHA, I don't think that's, that's what they say, but they recommend at least 150 minutes of moderate physical activity per week. And this can be um, brisk walking or tennis doubles. I like the tennis one, I don't know why. Or they recommend 75 minutes a week of vigorous activity. So this could be running or tennis singles. And they actually prefer a combination of this moderate activity and this vigorous activity. So they actually prefer you to maybe go for a brisk walk and then maybe you play tennis singles at some other time during the week. Finally, they recommend muscle strengthening activities at least two times a week, less sitting and more activity in general. If you can go above that 150 minutes a week, great, do it. Step number zero, right, is stay safe. Talk to your doctor if you haven't exercised in a while or you feel uncomfortable about exercising. I wanna reiterate here that I'm not giving medical advice. I am not a medical professional. These are just personal stories and kind of things that I like to talk about. So step one, now that we've passed step zero, is identify one form of exercise that you really like. Now, I don't want this to be some form of exercise that you think is gonna make me really, really healthy. I want you to identify a form of exercise that you really like. So really, maybe you really like walking with your friend and talking after lunch, or maybe you really like playing soccer, like I love playing soccer, or maybe you like playing tennis, or maybe you like rock climbing, maybe you really like doing anything. The point is, pick something that you really like doing, and the exercise can kind of come as a side effect. Some ideas are walking, swimming, group exercises, yoga, soccer, playing tennis, climbing stairs, dancing, gardening, or my personal favorite, having imaginary ninja battles with that evil apple that always stares at you from the corner of the room. They're not so imaginary. They're real. And number two, now we've identified something we like, we schedule it. Schedule this activity at least three times a week for 30 minutes. Maybe you do 30 minutes, three times a week of walking with your friend because you really like it. Keep in mind, you're not hitting that 150 minutes that the AHA recommends, but you're getting close, right? You'll get there eventually. Something that might be great is maybe your activity, this thing you really like is a vigorous activity, right? It's like tennis singles or running or something like that. Bottom line is start exercising. And our final point, our final major bullet point is meditation. So meditation can be practiced by anyone at any time, anywhere. And I know a lot of you, I mean, I remember when I first heard about meditation, I first had this thought that it's some mumbo jumbo, weirdo, kind of yogi master only strange people hippies do. But I've personally found that it's not really that. You're not necessarily going to some spiritual or even emotional level with it. You're really just getting a handle, more of a handle of the thoughts that go through your head, which I think is a pretty important thing to do and can be applied to whatever you do. Now, if you still don't believe me why it's such a good thing, let's try to talk about some real papers and some real evidence here that will hopefully sway you into thinking, huh, meditation, maybe that's kind of a good thing. Maybe I'll try it for five minutes a day for a month. That's not too much time, right? So paper numero uno, 22 patients with a generalized anxiety disorder or panic disorder were assessed before and during meditation-based stress reduction, MBSR programs that took place over eight weeks. Self ratings and the therapist ratings were gathered during the three months following treatment, and then they were examined. What they found is 20 out of 22, which is 91% of participants in the study showed significant reductions in anxiety and depression. Now, even cooler, these researchers went and found these patients again after three years. Keep in mind, they found them again three years following an eight week exercise. So they only included 18 of the previous participants, 18 out of 22. And what they found is 18 out of 18, which is, hold on, I gotta do some math here. 
100% of the participants showed the same clinical significant improvement in anxiety and depression and all their outcome measures as they did when they first took place in this meditation kind of based stress reduction program three years ago. And that's crazy to me. Three years later, after just eight weeks, I wanna mention briefly that this meditation-based stress reduction, this MBSR, is a standardized and intensive program. These are people that are going into programs and they're going through them intensely for eight weeks. And researchers need these standardized methods, right, so they can verify them and compare them to other researchers' results. Because if you had a group of 22 people meditate by standing on their head for three hours a day versus a group of people who meditated by running seven miles a day, the results are gonna be different, right? So they need a standardized method so they can compare and contrast results. MBSR, however, is a form of meditation Meditation. It's not necessarily better than other forms of meditation, and it's not necessarily worse than other forms of meditation. It's just a form of meditation that researchers like to do because it's standardized. But 22 patients for me is not enough to come to a generalizable conclusion about this whole meditation thing. And also, the patients looked at were people that were suffering from severe diseases, right? General anxiety disorder or panic disorder. What about other people that don't have these clinically severe forms of anxiety and panic? Well, let's get meta. In a meta-analysis looking at 10 studies, researchers concluded MBSR is able to reduce stress levels in healthy people. Okay, we're good on the why. Let's talk about the how. First one, which is the most easily implementable one, is breathing. No matter where I am, no matter what I'm doing, I can implement this breathing technique and generally I'll feel better afterwards. Sometimes I do this when I'm feeling like stressed in between an important test, like when I was taking the MCAT or when I was taking step one, I use this. It's called the 478 breathing technique and it's fairly straightforward, right? You breathe in for four seconds, you hold it for seven seconds, and then you breathe out for eight seconds. And whenever I do this, I usually do that three times, that 478 technique three times. I usually always feel better, and I haven't tested this, but I'm sure my performance is better as well. Because remember, I'm trying to stop myself from going over this U-shaped curve. I'm trying to keep myself at the top, not over the edge. Because when you go over the top, when you go over the U-shaped curve, your stress is too high and your cognitive performance goes down. Use of similar breathing exercises in 60 healthy participants aged 17 to 19 years old resulted in significant changes in parasympathetic activity. And just think of parasympathetic activity as the opposite of sympathetic activity, which is commonly defined as your fight or flight. When your sympathetic activity increases, your heart rate increases. When your parasympathetic activity increases, your heart rate decreases. And there's obviously a lot more things going on there, but that's just a good basic way to kind of think about parasympathetic and sympathetic activity. So these participants showed significant changes in parasympathetic activity as measured by various heart outcomes. So the next technique, technique numero two, numero two, Technique number two is progressive muscle relaxation. So PMR is exactly that. You're progressively relaxing each part of your body. I'm not gonna go into an in-depth guide about how to do this because there's people that are much better at it. I'm gonna link a written version from the University of Michigan, which is really well done on how to do this progressive muscle relaxation. I'm gonna link a video, which is just an audio version that's for free on YouTube on how to go through this progressive muscle relaxation technique. And also there are apps that you can get for this that do this, right? You can get Calm or Headspace, which are not sponsoring this video. I wish they were sponsoring this video, but those are great things that I use pretty much every day. I'll either use Headspace or Calm to do some sort of meditation. What I do, what it is, and again, if you want more in depth, go to the resources I just said, is I just start working down my body and tensing and then relaxing each part of my body. So this might be wrinkling my forehead a lot for four to 10 seconds and then relaxing it for 10 to 20 seconds. Then maybe I'll close my eyes really tightly for four to 10 seconds, and then relax them for 10 to 20 seconds. Then maybe I'll smile as widely as I can and look like a freak, look at this. <laughs> and then relax it for 10 to 20 seconds. And I'll move all the way down. You can even, I'm already relaxed from doing that and I'm not even doing it fully, I'm just doing it for the video. You can already, I already feel relaxed from it. And you just move all the way down your body until you get your toes. So you'll tense your toes and then relax it for four to 10 seconds. And I feel, I, I literally only did four different parts of my body that took probably 45 seconds, but I already feel better. So imagine what, how it feels when you go all the way down your body. 
So finally, let's talk about other forms of meditation. I've heard about breathing. I never really heard about progressive muscle relaxation before, but the one that pops into my head or always popped into my head when I was thinking about meditation was, you know, the classical, you sit cross-legged with your knees, lift your shoulders up and kind of sit there and breathe. And this is what is classically thought of as meditation. And this is what I do. Specifically, the, the form I practice is mindfulness meditation. So what I'm doing right now is I usually meditate 20 minutes a day directly after I take a shower. And I started with only five minutes of meditation a day. And the way I built this habit was something I learned from reading Atomic Habits and this idea of habit stacking. Every morning after I shower, I'm gonna meditate. And that's what I did. I meditated after I showered every morning. My meditation habit is stacked on top of my showering app. And what is this the actual 20 minutes compose of? Well, currently I use an app called Insight Timer and I'll just set that for 20 minutes with a one minute warm up. And I'll just sit cross-legged on a cushion because my hips are awful and I'll just sit there and kind of cuss my hands together, close my eyes and just begin breathing, right? It's really hard, you have to begin breathing. Great thing about this kind of thing is that you can't mess it up. The only way you can mess it up is if you get up and, and leave the meditation. If you sit there for 20 minutes, even if you open your eyes, even if you're thinking about that test you just took, even if you're thinking about a fight you just had, it doesn't matter. It's still meditation. As long as you're sitting there, kind of, you can be doing whatever, you could be laying down, but as long as you're sitting there just chilling out, you're meditating. First thing I do is I take three kind of deep breaths using that four, seven, eight technique. So I'll take three big deep breaths. And then for the next five minutes, I'll do the progressive muscle relaxation technique, kind of from the top of my head down. And this is a abbreviated version because if you do the full version, it's usually like 20 minutes, but I just do kind of a quick scan starting at the top and going all the way down to my toes. And then simply, I just start counting my breaths. So I've done my three deep breaths. I've scanned from the top of my head to the bottom of my toes. And now all I do is I just count my breathing. Often I'll get distracted by a thought or a random noise in the city of Philadelphia as often happen, but that's okay. I'll just bring myself back. And as soon as I bring myself back, I'll notice my breath again and start counting. And usually I get to about the number 130 where I count to the number 130. And then once I get there, I just let it all go. I just let the counting go. I let my kind of focus on my nose go. And I just let everything come into my head and just see what's happening. So when I was first doing this, I was only doing five minutes a day. And then I did 10 minutes a day. And then I did 15 minutes a day. The most important thing is just trying to do it consistently, kind of, I think every day. I like to do it in the morning, again, right after I shower. We did it, we made it through all three points. Now I'm just gonna summarize and talk about taking action. Stress is our body's response to a perceived threat, but sometimes the stress is a little bit too much and our stress response goes on overdrive and our performance starts to suffer. Some of the best ways I've found to reduce stress are adopt a positive mindset by eliminating negative thoughts, focusing on the positive thoughts and improving your self-esteem. Also exercise has been shown to be very helpful for reducing stress and it's helped me immensely. And finally, meditation has been shown to reduce stress and has helped me immensely. Daily integration of even one of these things can provide significant benefits. I always exercise, but I never really meditated and I never really thought about the thoughts going into my head. So that's what I'm working on now, right? I'm trying to focus more on meditation and focusing on the thoughts. I still exercise, but I've kind of always exercised, so that's kind of not something that I need to change. This was a lot of information, right? How You can't do all of these things at once. There's no way. But how do you take action and start de-stressing? Not, de not distressing, but de-stressing. Well, I don't know the best way. I don't think anyone knows the best way. I just know what's worked for me and what is evidenced in many of these papers. So I'm gonna give three action-taking options for reducing stress and improving performance that you can do right now. If you're doing none of these things, that's okay. Maybe just pick one and try it out a little bit. Try it out for a week, try it out for a month. If you're doing two of these things, that's great. Just maybe add the third one in and try it out. If you're doing all three of these things, that's great. But I'm sure you can get a little bit better, do a little bit more with one of these things. These specific action taking things are gonna be about positive mindset, exercise, and meditation. So what is one action taking thing we can take around mindset? Well, one specific thing that I think is really helpful and it's helped me a lot is something called a positivity journal. Buy a journal, I like handwritten journal, but you can type it up on your computer, leave it on your phone. I don't know, it's something about handwriting that I like. But what you're gonna do is every morning, right, as soon as you wake up, write two things that you are grateful for. 
And it's hard at first. You're like, I want it, what's going on? But slowly you'll be able to learn that, oh, there's some pretty cool things. And then you go throughout your entire day. And then right before bed, you write two things that you did well today, two things that you accomplished. And this is gonna help with that self-esteem. So again, in the morning, just write two things you're grateful for. And at night, write two things that you accomplished, two things that you did well, two reasons you are a badass. The next thing is around exercise. So pick two exercises you like and do those exercises for a total of five times a week, 30 minutes each, every week. So maybe this is walking and lifting weights. So what you could do is every Monday, Wednesday, Friday at lunchtime with someone you like to walk with, you'll walk for 30 minutes. And then on Tuesday and Thursday, you'll go to the gym and lift weights for 30 minutes. And I understand it's hard to find time, but this is your body, this is your mind, this is your life we're talking about here. And finally, meditation. Meditation, what's a specific thing we can do to start implementing meditation daily? Well, one thing you can do is just meditate five minutes every day in the morning, right after you take a shower. I think that's a great way to do it. It doesn't have to be the mindfulness meditation I do. It could be guided, it could be mantra, it could be Tai Chi, it could be yoga, it could be anything. Meditation is great because there are so many ways to meditate and meditating is a great way to reduce stress. So you made it to the end of this video. Bottom, bottom line, a positive mindset, exercise and meditation are great ways to reduce stress and improve performance. And if you start integrating even one of these habits daily, they can show significant benefits over time. Maybe you feel a little bit motivated, a little bit excited to start one of these things. Maybe you get to buy a fancy journal. Maybe you're gonna walk with a friend you haven't walked with before. Maybe you're just gonna start feeling better about yourself, which all are great things. But if you made it to the end of this video, thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next one. Yeah, the sky's blue today. I only do it when it's cloudy. The sky has like only clouds. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, though.